Damn, I really need some food. Um, does this make kebabs? Oh, hope it cooks fast. Come on, come on. Cook, 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 cook. Wait, what? Oh, man. Ugh, crap. Hey there, my name is Salandrak, and I am back with the fourth episode of my Don't Starve Beginner's Guide series. In today's episode, we're going to take a fairly extensive deep dive into the topic of food. After all, given the name of the game is Don't Starve, it seems appropriate for a full episode to be devoted to the topic of, well, not starving. Although a few food-related topics were covered in prior videos in the series, the goal of this video is to help you really understand the mechanics of hunger and how food, and particularly crockpot dishes, can be used to manipulate your hunger, health, and sanity to ensure your survival. As a beginner's guide to food, I'll also give you a comprehensive food strategy, including four top recommended crockpot recipes to help you maximize the benefits of a small list of ingredients so you can focus less on food and more on everything else. And as an FYI, although this series is focused on the single-player Reign of Giants version of Don't Starve, all of the food items and recipes covered in this guide are available in the other single-player DLCs as well as the multiplayer Don't Starve Together. That said, the other versions do have additional exclusive recipes that you might want to learn that are beyond the scope of this video. For a complete list of crockpot recipes, check the wiki link below. And as always, timestamps and links to helpful information are down in the description, and if you find this video helpful, informative, or at the very least somewhat entertaining, please hit that like button and subscribe to help me help you. Now let's get started! Before you can understand food, you need to understand hunger, which is represented by your stomach in your stats area. Each character starts the game with a full stomach, which will drain over time unless or until food is eaten to refill the belly. For purposes of this video, we'll simply refer to the number on your stomach and the nutritional benefit you get from food as food points, or just food for short. Now most characters have a full belly at 150 food points, though some characters have more while a few have less. The rate at which consumed food decreases in the stomach is 9.375 points per minute for most characters, or 75 food per day. Though again, some characters get hungry faster and there are a few items that can decrease the rate at which you get hungry. For the most part though, the key takeaway is that you'll need to eat about 75 points of food per day in order to fend off starvation but a full belly gives you a two-day buffer during which you can survive with no food before you start to die of starvation. And speaking of starvation, once the belly is completely empty, you'll start to lose one and a quarter health per second until you either eat some food or die. When you first enter a new world, you'll be stuck foraging for the first five to 10 days before you can start building kitchen structures. During this time, you'll only have access to things like berries, carrots, seeds, and butterflies, along with whatever meat you might be able to get your hands on. One raw berry or butterfly wing restores the same amount of hunger as you lose per minute, so to stay fed on just raw berries or butterfly wings, you would need to eat 8 of these per day. Seeds, whether cooked or raw, restore half that amount, so you'd need to eat 16 seeds per day, whereas carrots, cooked or raw, provide slightly more food and only require 6 per day to stay well fed. It's a good idea to always keep about two days worth of food on your character while exploring, just in case you enter an area where food is sparse. And try to keep the kinds of foods to maybe two or three types, more than that will just take up too much valuable inventory space during these early stages of the game. Once you start to establish your base, you'll quickly want to shift from foraging to other dietary methods. Efficiency is important in Don't Starve, and you'll generally want to spend as little time and effort as possible keeping yourself fed, in order to free up more time for other activities in the game. Comparatively speaking, foraging is just not an efficient way to stave off hunger. To really maximize your food production, you'll need to set up a good kitchen complete with crock pots, ice boxes, a bird cage, and drying racks. For more on setting up your kitchen as well as the rest of an early game base, check out the second video in the series. It's almost time to kick your culinary skills into high gear with a crockpot, but let's take a minute first to talk about a game concept commonly known as bonus hunger points, or simply bonus points for short. The idea is basically this. Whenever you combine ingredients in the crockpot such that the finished dish provides more benefit than the individual ingredients, then you have increased the value of the ingredients and realized bonus points. The more points the better, as it is an overall efficiency win. Here's a couple of examples. If you were to make meatballs using a cooked morsel and three pieces of ice, the food value of the ingredients is 19.4. 
The cooked morsel is 12.5 food, and each ice is a measly 2.3 apiece. Because the finished dish, the meatballs, provides 62.5 food points, you have realized 43.1 bonus points of food, the difference between the finished dish and the sum of the ingredients. Once you understand how this works, you'll start to realize that there are sometimes better and worse ways to make a given dish. As another example, if you were to make meatballs using a cooked meat, food value of 25, and three carrots, 12.5 food each for 37.5 food from all the carrots, your ingredients would have a food value of 62.5, the same as a plate of meatballs for no bonus points at all. The real upshot of the bonus points concept is that although there are over 30 crockpot dishes in Reign of Giants, and almost 60 total recipes across all the DLCs and Don't Starve Together, many of these recipes don't provide enough bonus points to make them worthwhile particularly when there are better options available. Consequently, you can do just fine with a repertoire of about four crockpot recipes that have high bonus point potential or other benefits, which we'll go over a little later. I covered food freshness a little bit in the first guide in the series, so hopefully you remember that food spoils over time, being fresh from 50 to 100%, stale from 21 to 49%, and spoiled when at 20% or below. Whenever a food item is cooked, the amount of spoilage is cut in half, which remains true for cooking with the crock pot. Since multiple ingredients are used as inputs, the output will basically be the average of the inputs. So, for example, if you made a meaty stew using ingredients that were all at 40% and stale, the resulting stew would be at 70% fresh. Want to really maximize the freshness of your crock pot meal when your food stores are all raw but stale or spoiled? Take the raw ingredients, cook them on the fire first to reduce spoilage by half, then add those ingredients to the crock pot to reduce spoilage by half again. Different recipes have different perish times, and in general, I tend to prefer recipes that last longer if I'm going away from base, while focusing on efficiency or bonus points when at base. Now, one major caveat to the shelf life consideration is a somewhat game-breaking item that is quite easy to acquire in Reign of Giants, the bundling wrap. You can only learn it from a blueprint that has a 4% chance to drop from regular and killer bees, but once learned, you can refine a honeycomb, obtained from any beehive, into beeswax, then refine that with a papyrus to make wax paper. Finally, you can combine the wax paper with a rope to form the bundling wrap. This item allows you to bundle up to 4 stacks of items into a package of bundled supplies, which is a great way to make a care package and further expand your inventory. But here's the real kicker. Food items do not spoil while they are in the bundling wrap. So you can literally pack it with a ton of food, then open it to take a few items out, then rebundle the rest for the low cost of a single rope. Can you say eternal meatballs? Before we get to some crockpot recipes, it's important to understand how the recipes work, which requires understanding a couple food types and values. I won't go over all the different types of foods in this video, but will instead focus on the types and most common examples of the ones you'll need for the recipes that I do cover in the video. And those types are simply meats, vegetables, and eggs. Meats in Reign of Giants all have a meat value of 1 or 0.5, what I like to refer to as big meats and small meats. The one value big meats are monster meat and meat, which drops from large game like beefalo, coalifants, and tall birds. The 0.5 value small meats are basically everything else that seems like a meat type of food and includes the morsels from rabbits, birds, and mole worms, drumsticks from gobblers, frog legs, as well as fish and eels. Eggs is really simple. In Reign of Giants, there are only two types of eggs. The generic eggs you get by feeding meat to a bird or stealing from pangles, and the tall bird eggs from a tall bird nest. Regular eggs have an egg value of one egg, while tall bird eggs have an egg value of four. However, it's not worth using tall bird eggs in a crock pot as they don't stack and you're better off just cooking one over a fire and eating it if you're out and about and manage to grab one. Vegetables include red, green, and blue mushroom caps, carrots, cactus flesh, and many of the crops you can grow from seeds with a garden. However, for purposes of this guide, I do not recommend that you make gardens in order to grow crops. They're generally not worth the time and effort, particularly when you're learning the game. Like meat, vegetables also have values of 0.5 or 1, but those values only matter for a few niche recipes that I won't be covering in this video. For recipes that I use here, you just need any old veggie. Other types of foods that aren't relevant to this video are fruits, sweeteners, dairy, and fish. So keep those in mind if you start learning other recipes. 
Crock-Pot dishes are created when ingredients that meet a recipe's requirements are placed in the pot and cooked. Recipes generally require certain values of one or more types of food, such as three meat value for a meaty stew, certain specific items, such as sticks for kebabs or fish sticks, and sometimes exclude specific items, such as no vegetables in a bacon and eggs. So, for example, the requirements for meatballs is simply a meat value of greater than zero and no twigs. As such, there are a ton of possible ingredient combinations that can produce meatballs. Here's a few examples. One meat and three berries. How about one morsel and three ice? Or a monster meat, two morsels and a carrot? Or even two meat, a cooked berry and a carrot? All of these combinations will result in meatballs, but remember the concept of bonus points? How many bonus points do each of these recipe variations realize? As you can see, hands down, the version using three ice as the non-meat filler is definitely the best way to go. But in the early game, if you don't have ice, it is perfectly fine to use berries or mushrooms as you work on getting established. But please don't use that last recipe with two meats. You're actually wasting food making meatballs with those ingredients. Here's another example of a crockpot recipe. In order to make bacon and eggs, you need to have an egg value of greater than one, a meat value of greater than one, and cannot have any vegetables. Since regular eggs have a value of one egg anyways, that means you just need two eggs. And the best way to get a meat value of greater than one is to combine a monster meat with a small meat of some kind, such as a morsel, drumstick, and voila, you've got some tasty bacon and eggs. Now, you may have noticed that technically the recipe for bacon and eggs also meets the criteria for meatballs, so why does it never result in meatballs? Well, the game has a priority ranking for recipes, and whenever the ingredients technically meet the requirements for more than one recipe, whichever recipe has a higher priority will actually be made. In general, more restrictive or complex recipes tend to have higher priority than simple recipes like meatballs. If there's more than one recipe with equal priority, the game will, with a few exceptions, randomly pick between the two. For example, if you put a fish, a frog leg, an ear of corn, and a twig in the crock pot, you will actually meet the recipe requirements for four different outcomes, two of which tie for highest priority, namely fish sticks and fish tacos, which the game will randomly pick between. The lower priority kebabs and froggle bunwich will not be made. Speaking of Froggle Bunwich, have you ever been trying to make meatballs and accidentally made this mediocre sandwich? This raises a general rule of thumb that you'll want to remember, namely, if you're trying to make meatballs with any frog legs, do not use any vegetables as filler. Froggle Bunwich is a recipe that requires only a frog leg and a vegetable and has higher priority than meatballs, but lower than most other dishes. It's an okay healing food, but you'll only want to make it using either two ice or two twigs as filler. Otherwise, it's just not good on the food scale and is a waste of ingredients. Another rule of thumb you'll want to always remember is, with very few exceptions that I won't mention here, never put more than one monster food into the crock pot. Monster foods includes monster meat, whether raw, cooked, or dried into monster jerky, as well as the durian fruit you can grow with a farm. Anytime you put two or more monster foods into the crock pot, the end result will be a nasty monster lasagna unless you also meet the requirements for a higher priority dish or you also included twigs, which monster lasagna excludes. If you do accidentally make a monster lasagna, you can get some value back by feeding it to your bird for an egg. But in general, just remember, one monster meat is perfectly fine, but more is no bueno. All right, now that we've covered all the basics and mechanics relating to the crock pot, here is a short list of four recipes I highly recommend you commit to memory or put on a post-it note for easy reference. For your at-base hunger abatement, there are two recipes you'll want to know by hand. The first has already been covered and is simply meatballs. Providing 62.5 food points and a scant 3 health and 5 sanity, this will be a staple food in all versions of Don't Starve, particularly if you have the bundling wrap. It is best made with a morsel or monster meat and three ice, but before winter when you likely won't have access to much ice, it can also be made using mushrooms, berries, roasted birch nuts, and just about anything really. The second recipe for general food restoration is a hunger and bonus point powerhouse, the meaty stew. This recipe requires a meat value of three or more and excludes twigs, honey, tall bird eggs, and mandrake, as adding any of these ingredients will result in a different higher priority outcome. 
The best way to make it is with a meat, a monster meat, and two small meats, and the end result will provide a whopping 150 food points, of which 87.5 are bonus points, along with 12 healing and 5 sanity. Best eaten when your belly is almost empty, otherwise you're wasting some of its 150 food points with most characters. It shares a 10 day shelf life with meatballs, so it isn't ideal for road trips unless stored in a bundling wrap. But as far as food efficiency goes, this one is hard to beat. The third recipe I recommend learning is my favorite pre-bundling wrap road tripper, bacon and eggs. Providing 75 hunger, a nice 20 healing, and 5 sanity, I like to think of the recipe as being sausage bacon and eggs, where the sausage is a big meat, the bacon is a small meat, and the eggs are, well, two eggs. The 20 day shelf life is what makes this dish great for road trips, though again, once you get the bundling wrap and a stockpile of ice, meatballs can be used instead. The fourth and final recipe I recommend committing to memory while you're learning the game is generally used as a healing food, pierogi. The recipe is a bit of a hodgepodge, it requires one egg, one meat, one vegetable, and then a fourth filler item excluding twigs and mandrakes. Good filler options are another egg, another vegetable, a berry, or even an ice. The dish shares a 20 day shelf life with bacon and eggs, provides a mediocre 37.5 food points, but a whopping 40 healing as well as 5 sanity. It's the healing that makes it so valuable though, as it is double what you get from a healing solve and 10 more than even a honey poultice. Note that I do recommend making these other healing items as they never spoil, but when you need lots of healing fast, having a few pierogi on hand can't be beat, particularly for boss fights. Now, there are a few other foods I recommend you keep on hand in your fridge at all times. The above mentioned crockpot dishes cover hunger and healing quite well, but you'll likely want a few alternatives as well as some sanity boosting foods. The most well rounded and balanced stat boosting food in the game is jerky, big or small, which provides excellent hunger, health, and sanity perks as well as a long 20 day shelf life. It is for this reason I recommend at least two drying racks as soon as possible, expanding up to eight when you're able to do so. For straight up sanity restoration that doesn't require dry times, the best options are cooked green caps and cooked cactus flesh. Green mushrooms are fairly common in forests and swamps and pop out during dusk, while cactus flesh is easy to find and grows year round in the desert. Just be sure to wear armor when picking the cactus, dang spinous structure. Since you won't need these veggies for sanity restoration all that often, they can pull double duty as the vegetable for your pierogi whenever you need healing food, thereby conserving space in your icebox. Win-win! And speaking of your icebox, before we wrap things up, here's what I would recommend as a shopping list for your icebox pantry and, unless otherwise mentioned, try to keep at least 5 or more of each of these items in your fridge at all times. Meat, which you'll need for at base meaty stews hanging on your drying racks for big jerky, and for the occasional ham bat, an excellent weapon for taking down anything including giants, especially when it's fresh. Good early game sources of meat are koala fans, beefalo, tall birds, pigmen, and were pigs. Monster meat. As you start getting larger and larger hound attacks, you'll eventually be swimming in monster meat. It can be used as the meat for meatballs and included in meaty stew as well as convert it into eggs for your bacon and eggs and pierogies. Excess monster meat can also be turned into eggs and given to the pig king to stock up on gold at a 1 to 1 ratio of meat to gold. Running short on monster meat? Go fight some spiders and you'll be good to go. Small meat. There are several options for this one depending on what's available near your base, but many of these options aren't available year round such as rabbits or frogs. Rabbit traps are also fairly resource intensive and can strain your grass and twig supplies. Instead, I think the best option is to transplant 4-6 to six mole worms if there aren't any near your base already. They are commonly found in the deciduous forests and can simply be dug up with a shovel and smacked with a hammer during the day and then dropped live on the ground near your base. They'll scurry off a short distance and make a new burrow and can thereafter be killed whenever they respawn to satisfy all your small meat needs. Just remember, if you destroy the burrow while a mole worm is dead, it won't be able to respawn. Eggs. This one is really simple. Feed any meat you have an excess of to your caged bird, particularly meats that are less than fresh. Easy peasy. Just remember, birds don't eat raw monster meat. It has to be cooked on a campfire first. Vegetables. This one may require some wandering now and then to stock up, but as mentioned earlier, cactus in the desert works great year round. It regrows every three days in spring, four days the rest of the year. Mushrooms grow mostly in grasslands, forests, and swamps and regrow after getting enough rain. 
It's really nice if you can find a mushroom ring set piece, but those aren't necessarily in every world. Fillers. Filler refers to any ingredients used to fill the four ingredient requirement of the crock pot beyond what the recipe requires. Your primary filler for both meatballs and pierogi will usually be ice, which is easy to stockpile during winter by running near the coast to spawn pangles and then mining the mini glaciers that form at their nesting grounds. It's recommended that you get at least two stacks of ice as soon as you can at the start of winter as it is by far the most efficient way to keep yourself well fed year round. Added bonus? Ice never spoils when kept in your ice box. Another alternative is to put together a berry bush farm near your base, which will also provide some small meat from the gobblers that inevitably will spawn. Remember to build a small fenced area and bait the gobblers with a berry so they won't run off and live up to their name on your unpicked bushes. For pantry organization, I like to keep all my basic crockpot ingredients in one of my ice boxes and then keep jerky, excess ice, and any pre-prepared meals in the other fridge. And that's basically it, an all-inclusive approach to food that will keep your character's belly full, mind happy, and heart strong throughout the entire game. But you might be thinking to yourself that keeping your fridge stocked with all these different foods sounds like a lot of effort, and you might be wondering if there's not some food production methods that, once set up, will provide all your food needs with minimal effort thereafter. Well, you're right, there are. But that's a topic for a later video. That's all for today. Please let me know down in the comments if you're able to improve your survivability using the strategies presented in this video. As noted earlier, this is a beginner's guide to food, and as you get more experienced in the game, it is certainly worthwhile to add other recipes and foods to your repertoire, especially in the other DLCs or Don't Starve Together. But the goal here was to give you a solid foundation that will solve your hunger, health, and sanity needs so you can focus more attention on other aspects of the game. In our next video, we'll be getting back to those other aspects and we'll talk about preparing for and surviving during the winter season. So please hit that subscribe button so you'll know when it comes out. And if you learned anything from this video, do me a favor and smash that like button. Thanks for watching, now get out there and don't starve!